Welcome to this week's West London Sport QBR video pod. Uh, we're rotating the squad this week with Kevin and Dan away on holiday. Uh, so I'm ho- in the hosting hot seat this week. Uh, so we've brought in former QBR midfielder, first team coach, assistant manager, academy coach, as well as been a lifelong fan, Mark Burchin, on an emergency loan deal. <laughs> uh, and there's a return to the side for one of the busiest men in journalism, uh, ex Kilburn Times sports editor, current QBR programme editor, Ben Kosky, who's actually live at Lords today, covering the start of Middlesex County cricket season. So uh, thanks for joining us, fellas. Uh, so we'll kick off with, uh, there's another defeat for Rangers, uh, a fourth at succession at Sheffield United on Tuesday. Uh, I was up by Bramall Lane, and although in the second half there were some marginal improvements uh, from recent games, uh, Rangers really didn't do remotely enough to win the game against a side that, frankly, were there for the taking in what was another hammer blow to their playoff hopes. Uh, defeats of last week to runaway leaders Fulham led to reports that Mark Warburton was going to get sacked um, now we know that's unlikely to happen to, um, certainly uh, during this season but uh, given the number of games left in the season and his contract being up uh, his future is very much up in the air uh, first is you Birch uh, what's your take on Rangers recent wretched run and you know, can you see them sort of stopping the rot in the next sort of five or six games left of the season no not really uh you can't, for me, you can't really affect results too much, but you can definitely affect performances. And I think that's what's been so poor since New Year's is that other than the Reading game, where, where they was useless, that's being nice to them. I've never seen us like dominate and create loads of chances. And I know because I've been to quite a few games and they never do well when I'm there. But I think if, if we was performing well and not getting a result, you could say, yeah, we can turn it around. But it's going to take something big. It might be a lucky game. It might be a lucky result this weekend that we win and turn it round. But I can't see it. I, I don't want to hate being right, but I was saying it before when we were second and third in the league. If we was at heady heights that we probably didn't deserve to be at. We was scoring a lot of last-minute goals, nicking games, especially away from home, Coventry, Berman, and when we was going away from home, we weren't playing that well and was the second best in their games and coming away with wins. And I just thought it would even out and... I think where we are in the league is where we probably should be at the minute. So do you think at the start of the season then they were maybe punching above their weight, being sort of in the top? Oh, we was miles punching above our weight from being second in the league, third in the league. I didn't think we were playing well enough to be up there. And I kept saying to my family and friends, oh, we, they were, we're definitely making playoffs. I'm like, relax, relax, this is QPR. Uh, we, we'll find a way to mess it up. But no, I just think, look, we was getting a bit of luck in them games, and now recently we haven't got so much luck, the rub of the green. But you look at the two wins we've got this year. Blackpool, we'd have been lucky to get a draw. I know we worked really hard with 10 men and we got behind the ball, but they missed some chances. And we ended up winning that one. And the Luton away game, we didn't deserve to win that. Probably a draw would have been the best for us. And we've ended up, the two wins that we've got, we didn't deserve to win. So that always tells the story of how you're actually doing. And... With players and managers and all that, you get judged when you're, you're doing bad. Are you going to turn it around? I can't see us turning it around at the minute. Okay. And your thoughts, Ben? I mean, obviously, the game against Fulham on Saturday, it was at times a bit men against boys. And, you know, given the squad they've got and the money they've spent, I suppose, in many ways, it, it's sort of understandable. But, you know, what have you seen of the last sort of, I guess, last six games? Uh, what's your take on it? Well, I think, I think the thing that stands out for me, really, is uh, how rarely the opposition goalkeeper has been worked. Um, you know, it's uh, everyone talks about uh, this question of should, should we have brought another striker in in January? I, I think that simplifies it a little bit more because, to me, it's more about that the strikers are not getting service, they're not creating the chance, or the chances are not being created. And I look back at those, those last three games, Fulham, uh, sorry, um, Sheffield United, Fulham, uh, and, and Peterborough, of course, and I can't think of in any of those games where the opposition goalkeeper has had to make more than a routine save all game. Yeah, we've had um, shots on target in five games. Right. So, so, so there's the stat, and, and, and that bears it out. And um, you can look at a, a number of factors, can't you? I mean, I think we we would all agree um, losing Chris Willock has been a massive uh, a massive blow. Um, the most creative outlet there is. The goalkeeping situation has certainly not helped, um, you know, through nobody's fault, really. And, uh, I mean, I, I think the way I, I would look at it now is, as I say, there's six games to go. And, you know, 
that they are important because uh, it's potentially if, if you can regain a little bit of form, uh, potentially finish in uh, a top 10 position, you know, which is certainly respectable. Yeah. It's either that or you end up finishing about 14th, 15th, which it's very hard then to make a case of saying you, you've progressed this season because uh, the, the league position would suggest otherwise. But um, it, it's, it's hard to see, isn't it, where that break is coming from at the moment? Because uh, at, at this stage, you you look at uh, you look at those games, and again, I don't think there's ever been a point where where you felt there was a comeback on the cards. Um, I mean, Fulham, for instance, we can argue about the penalty award, and it was a harsh penalty award. Well, if we're honest, it, it only made the difference of whether Fulham win one 0 or two 0 because Rangers never looked like get, getting a goal in that. So, um, yeah, it's it's. It's a tricky situation, isn't it? But I, I honestly feel um, these last six games, you know, w- whether the playoffs, uh, and some will say they're still attainable, um, but whether they, they are, are or they not... They are, then, really. When it's, you look at it, it's only four points. If you'd have offered it at the start of the season, yeah. there's, what, six games left and you're four points off playoffs, that positive side, you should look at that as staff and players to focus on that. You've got a chance. But mm. other teams around us are better teams and they're more informed. Yeah, and it comes down to momentum as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Birch, if, if if you had a run now and you've got yourself in a position like like Luton have or yeah. uh, uh, teams like that, then of course you, you fancy your chances. But when you're on the slide, you, you tend to look at it very differently. But you are right, mathematically, it's it's still all to play for. Birch, you've been obviously part of management at QBR and a player at QBR, and you'd have been involved in sides that are on a pretty a bad run of form and trying to get out of it. What what will be what will be being said, sort of among the players and and the management team to this? You know, what how do you sort of cope with where you are? Because it's it different as a as a player, I was always positive that we could get round if we stick. And it's about going back to basics. Just give players less options when they're going for a bad run of form. When they're low on confidence, the least options possible. And again, as a as a coach, you'd work on a plan B. And I know. As a team, I've not seen that in them games when it probably looked like we've changed. Like we, when I when our coach when we done it, we done it with Matt Smith, where we'd probably bring him on and we'd get it wide quicker and get the balls in the box quicker. And the lads knew we used to we used to work on that in training. Look, if we need to change this, this is what we're doing. So people knew their jobs. And to be fair, we did come back a lot when we had that plan B. But I don't see that we have that. Sometimes when we play the two centre forwards, we play Lyndon and and Charlie or or Gray and Lyndon, they're out there. It's, it, it hit me Barnsley away when we was there, where they was on the ropes. You could tell they was low on confidence. And we, they won them up, and we didn't put them under any sort of pressure. We sort of got a chance where Dykes missed a header from six yards out. That was the only chance. I mean, I'd love to see, right, this is what we're going to go for it. If you do have to change your tactics, I've said it before, Wenger and Mourinho. I think Wenger has played Mourinho 14 times, never beat him because Wenger has the plan A and plan B is to do plan A better. And Mourinho would put his nan in goal with it at a belt and he'd do anything to get the win. So it's different like that. I'd be more confident if we can have a right go. And that's, I think, what Ben said. As a fan, all these games, you can lose games, but it's never really felt like, oh, we're giving it, we've got a chance here, we're, it, the crowd's buzzing and it's going. It's just been a bit flat. What stage, though, does it, I mean, players play the match, the manager picks the team, but at what stage is it, are, are players too overcoached now? Are they, are they, is there less of a emphasis on players making a decision themselves just to try something different, or does it all stem from what the manager's telling them to do? It, it comes from the manager and the coaching staff, what they sort of put that out to them. Of course, when players are on there, they do their own thing. Look, when we look, cuts inside that blackboard, bends it in the top corner from 30 yards, they haven't worked on that in training. That's individual skill. And I think that's why we've relied on him and Ilias a lot. A bit like when uh, Adele was in the team when we won the championship. Individual brilliance would get in there. And that's what we sort of relied on. Oh, this is what we're going to be solid and hopefully one of them would create or nick a goal. And you can only do that for a certain amount of time. And now one of them's injured. Ilias has had a knock and been away in the African nations and it's been hard. But you're trying to put your finger on it. It's 
our performance is having probably warranted us being up there and deserving there. So we are where we are. But I'd love to think that they're in there now when they've come away from that international break. I know the Fulham game is out of the way. To say, look, we've got these games left. We're only four points behind. North averages say we're going to stick a few results together. Let's start from now, from Preston. Is it too simplistic just to say, well, you know, Chris Willock's out for the season, you know, and he's such a massive part of what they do well, um, makes other players around him play well, and him not being there is a major factor in why they're in the state they're in? Yeah, well, no, that is that affects your plan A, but you need a plan B, a plan C, a plan D to say, look, look at the opposition. We might have to change this way. We can't always play the same formation and pick a different formation or tactics to beat that team. Like you'll probably look at Preston's last few games. I think, well, we can unpick him here. Ryan Lowe's got them going. He's, he's, he's changed them. Maybe we can pick a different format. If we can, definition of madness, if you keep doing the same things and it keeps getting the same result and you keep doing it, then you do it. What's the point? So at this time of year, let's chuck a curveball in and do something different. Well, just, just to play devil's advocate, like at Forest away, he played Sanderson to kind of kind of combat the threat of Brennan Johnson and and Jed Spence, and ultimately it didn't work. I mean, is it is having an, a plan B, such to speak? Is it just a case of tweaking formation and putting different players in, or is it something completely different? Because I hear about it, people talking about it all the time, but I, I'm still kind of, what does plan B actually mean? Is it a case of just changing the well, formation? Throughout or? the season, you should work on two different formations anyway. So throughout the season, you know, you've got two different formations, you know it, and you've got two different scenarios you should work on last 20 minutes. One to get back into the game, one we're winning, this is what we're doing. So through the season, you should work on that. So really, it should only be tweaking what you know, whether it's set pieces, whether it's uh, the foot attacking play. Because when people talk about formations, that's crap. You've got a defensive shape and attacking shape. Because whatever formation that you play, you got teams either defend 4 4 1 1 or they defend 5 4 1. You don't attack in that shape when people in an attacking shape. You could, a bit like when the defensive midfielder comes into the back four to get the ball, wing backs by how and why Barcelona done it. Their attacking shape is 3 4 1 2. But you can play that as a 4 4 2. So it's, it's all completely different and tactical. You just want your team going back to old school, to have a right go. And the QPR fans were, oh, if we were throwing a kitchen sick at it and having a, having a right go at the team, us fans will take that all day long and you can lose games. But I think it's just so many games that have just fizzled out. Mm. You don't want that as a fan. You come there, you don't want it fizzled out. I, I could take being bang average for 70 minutes, but for them last 20, if you do give it a right go and throw everything it, then you can hold your hands up. But I don't think we can say that we've done that in the past three months. Do you think that's the short-term thing, though? Because, I mean, historically, since he's been there, I think they did have a, some sort of record of being having the most points from losing positions, et cetera, and so on. Is it just merely a case of they've hit a flat spot and they can't find a way out of it? And that's down to the manager? Well, as a manager, a coach, you have got to take the blame. You take the, the plaudits when you're doing well, and when the team ain't doing well, it does fall on the manager and the coaching staff, even if it ain't their fault. It is you're the manager of the team. You're picking the team. You're picking the tactics for these results. Of course, it falls on the players. We all know it's the players. But as a manager, you've got to take the blame because it's your team. Mm. OK. Ben, um, obviously, there was great speculation about Mark Warburton's uh, future after the, after the Fulham game. Um, you know, the signs don't appear good that he's going to be kept on after the end of the, at the end of the season. But, um, you know, winning changes everything, etc. Where do you stand on that? Do you think he should be given a new contract? Well, the funny thing, if you look at Mark Warburton's time as QPR manager, is, is it really has been a roller coaster. I mean, if, if you take it back to sort of Christmas of 2020, I don't think there's anyone who, who would have said he'd be in the job for, for a week longer, you know, and uh, as, as I like to say in my cliched way, Warburton was toast, you know, um, but um, he, he turned it around and then suddenly, you know, mid midway through this season, he's, he's looking like the, the greatest that I, I was going to say the greatest thing since sliced bread. I can't do the puns anymore, but, um, you know, and, and now suddenly we're at a stage where we're talking about does he stay or not after the summer? 
So, so it really has been peaks and troughs for, for, for him. Um, I mean, my, my view on, on the story that emerged after the Fulham game was that the, the idea of getting rid of a manager with seven games to go would be absolutely ridiculous. Serves no purpose because no one is going to come in who's such a magician that they're going to turn it around in that space of time to make a difference this season. But um, to be honest, for me, it, it kind of goes back to what happens in these remaining games because if they can rediscover some form, if they can get a bit of belief back and finish in a respectable position, then you can make a case for saying, well, Mark Warburton's guided us to another um, top half, top 10 position. So let's let's give it another go and, and see if he can you know, move it on next year. Whereas if the team ends up lower mid table, you'd have to say, well, things have gone backwards. Um, but the other thing I think you've always got to keep in mind and, and fans have always got their views on this. There'll be someone who's flavour of the month, the manager who's available uh, and they'll say, get him in, he'll, he'll do the job. And, and it's really that simple. You know, you, you've always got to think about who's out there, who, who, if you're going to make a change, who's it going to be? But as you said, Ian, it, the signs don't look great because normally I think a manager's contract is there's no smoke without up. fire. There's there's, no, no, there's no smoke without fire. And, and normally you're coming to this stage of the season, the manager's contract is up and you'd think there would have been some kind of discussion about extending it. So, but I, 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 I do feel it's not If the owners were really invested in the window and they don't believe he's the man to get us in the playoffs, I think it would have been the right move, Sackley. Because in, in January. No, as of now, if you got oh, seven now. games, if you got seven games to go, or then, and they didn't think he was going to get in there, and we got a chance of getting in there, and they think they might get a manager's bounce by throwing someone in, then fair enough. But for me, it would have been massively harsh on him. But you can't do that if you've not really invested in the window. I think if they had brought three or four players in, put some money down. And then they would have had an argument as a fan. I don't think you could have complained if they said, right, we've put that money in, we're going for the playoffs, we don't think he's there. But then it goes on to next season. Do they think, I think that's what Ollie mainly went for because if we was honest, we didn't think we could get that squad in the playoffs the next year. I don't think Jurgen Klopp could have got the squad we got in the playoffs next year, but they thought Steve McLaren could get that squad. Well, he was saying that he could get that squad in the playoffs with a few additions, which turned out he couldn't have. And they've got to think of a club. What's our blueprint? What's our remit? What do we want to do? One, is it about getting in the playoffs? Do they think Mark Burton can get us in the playoffs? If not, they let him go and get a new manager in. Is the remit in, we want to bring young players in the team so we have a sell-on value and we can make money that way? If it's that, then Mark Burton's not the man, Warburton's not the man because he hasn't done it in his squad. You look at the team, there's only Ilias there, probably Senny, that you could probably sell on for a good profit. And they, they was already in the team anyway, really. So it's like, what do you do as a club? You've got to think, this is what we want to do. It's about having your goals and your remit. This is what we want to do. Do they have that confidence in that manager? If not, then they make a change. But he can look back on his time and he's done well it results-wise. Again, if we do finish in the top 10, or maybe if we do nick the playoffs, then he can, he can look back at it. But he's had a good run at it. Was he probably, is he second longest manager in the, in the Football League at the minute, I think? I think, yeah. I th I think to be honest, it's uh, only, Ollie is the only manager who, who's lasted more than sort of three, three and a half, four years since and first, Alex Stott. And that, thing, and that was yeah. first time around. So, and, and if you'd have asked time. Mark Warburton when he comes and takes a job, are you looking to get us up in three years? We would have said yes, not gone up. So it's, I, I see both sides of it. I see it, I see it as a fan, I see it as a coach, and then uh, I see it from the club's point of view as well. The, the, we don't know who's right, but it depends. If they would have told him we're looking to get promoted in three years and you don't get promoted, then you can, as simple as that. Do, do you think, given like, the budget he, he's supposed to be working with, I mean, DFA released their agents' fees for last calendar year of last week. And like Rangers, I think they were 16th out of the, the 24 clubs. And, you know, clubs like Forest, Huddersfield, even Millwall would spend more money on, on agents' fees. Given the, the kind of, you know, the handcuffs that have applied to the club because of FFP, they didn't 
make a big splash in January, probably because they didn't felt that if they did and didn't go up, the, it, it's perhaps you're in a position like Derby or Sheffield Wednesday if you get if you breach it again. Do you think he's done a good job given everything in that respect, or do you think you know the money that was spent last summer in the budget, bringing in Johansson and Austin, it you know that was enough. That should have been enough think, to, to be where they are. Yeah, yeah, and no, because you can always outperform what you've what your budget is. But realistically, you got a ninety percent chance of where your budget is in the league. So if you're the highest paid players, uh, highest paid wage payers, you got ninety percent chance of finishing first. So, but there's always a couple of clubs that like punch above their weight on that side of things. But yeah, he's done, he hasn't done a bad job. And where we are now, I just think that was the golden egg to try and probably get in the Premier League. I know some fans give it, oh, I didn't want to go up and be too early. What a load of rubbish. Mm. Always go up as fans. Because are we going to have that chance again next year? Maybe being second at Christmas. I just think, I don't know. I don't know. It's a, again... It's just a yeah, it's a rock and hard place at the minute where you don't know whether it's a good season or it's a disappointing season. Mm. I think it's a bit of both. And but as a manager, if you if you're if you're if you say you can have three years at a club, you'll take that. Three years at a club to try and get promotion, or if not, step aside and someone else comes in. The grass isn't always greener. So it's, it's a difficult so I think it's just a club. What are we gonna be? Are we looking to go up? then get a manager in to get us up. If not, are we looking to be a pathway club and a setting club? Then we be that and don't... Re- and then anything in the league is a bonus because you're just looking at young... I just think we're caught between the two at the minute. We don't know what we are. Do you think, given like the current sort of financial constraints on all clubs in, outside the Premier League, you haven't got much choice but to do that unless you've got parachute payments? So, you, know, you look at Brentford, you know, they've had to sell on to... You know, I don't know, the likes of Scott Hogan, you got nine million for him and they bought Ollie Watkins for money and then made him into like a 30 million pound player. Is that, that, that always seems like the only way you can do it now? Because if, yeah, yeah. if, if you're going to be ready and have like 15 of your first team squad on a million pound a year plus, you're going to... But then you've got to play youngsters, whether mm. they're inconsistent or not, you've got to play youngsters in your team. So they're in the shop window to sell and not worry so much about league positions. And that's what you got to come out and say, this is our mission statement, this is what we're doing, and stick to it. I suppose Brentford could do that because there weren't that much pressure from their fans mm, yeah. to, to do well. So you, as that club, there wasn't that fan expectation and they haven't been up there all that time. So winning or losing didn't matter too much to them. But for QPR, we have been a successful team and our fans do want to win and, and go up. So it's... It's pleasing both aspects of that. But I suppose if we had to come out and say, there's our mission statement, we're just looking to be a selling club. And if there's a chance every year, just get better and better and better, and maybe we can go up. But you look at the team at the minute, there's not many to sell them. Hmm. Yeah. But if you'd have offered me ninth in the league at the start of the season, I would have taken that and said, that's a, that's a good finish. When you say there's no one you think you can sell on, do you not think, you know, maybe not currently right now, but players like Dickie, Dieng, uh, Jimmy Dunn. Yeah, uh, you, you don't Willow, know. Chair, you've got, you you have got some sellable assets there, potentially. Yeah, no, I, I think Chair and Willock, definitely, definitely. They're, they're two sell, they're sellable assets, but then what's coming in behind them? We don't know because the youngsters ain't played. Mm. And you don't know if they're good enough till they, they get in there. We, to be fair, we've done it with us. We had Paul Smith, we had we gave Ilias to go, we gave Easy a go, and we like, just get in there, and we, and we keep playing him. It was hard, it, and but we had really good older pros with us, because Jamie Mackey, Perchie, Nedham, all that lot got told they weren't getting contracts at Christmas. So at all that end of that season, and they helped the youngsters come through. So it was good, but you need to play them. And when we sell them, as we said, where's the conveyor belt, the ones coming through? It's, I just think we're... As I said, we're just in, caught in between two places at the minute and we don't really know what we're going. But uh, uh, fans, do you know what? Fans are so knee-jerk reaction. Rob Dickey was the new, honestly, Glenn Rhoda, Alan McDonald, Terry Fennick, all put him together because he scored a couple of goals and he played well for like a month. And a bit even Conor Masterson come in and played against Leeds Reserves in the FA Cup and they was the new Alan McDonald. And it's so neat. It's uh, honestly... 
it, it's like the fans are bipolar. Like one minute they're difficult, then they're it's just we just got to calm down. I said at the start of the season, people, I think I've done a podcast with Finney before and just said, look, relax yourselves, it's fine. If there's a way to mess it up, we always find a way to. I get quite happy when we do, so uh, I'm more comfortable. I don't like winning all that time. So uh, if year on year, if we can finish ninth or tenth, it's a progression as well. So if we can keep progressing, hopefully we will get up there. I'm a bit confused myself. I don't know what I want us to be, but uh, it, it's hard. I, I still think we've got an outside chance. Law of averages say we're going to stick a couple of back-to-back wins together. I'm hoping it's the next two. And also part part of it, Birch, that when, when you look at what has gone before, because when you and Ollie were in, in charge of things, you, you were kind of coming into a situation where this was a club that had not given any thought to developing players for the last probably 10 years. So so you had a very low base to start from. And isn't, isn't it perhaps the case that, you know, it's just going to take time for that system to kind of gather pace again? Yeah, I think it's a... It's a critical time now I think with me and Ollie I can look back when we finished 15th there the average age of the squad the last month of the season was uh, 24 years of age and I just thought that next day they took Steve McLaren in and them youngsters got held back they they missed a whole season of football really all of them where now if they do look to make a change is it better the devil you know than the devil you don't and just say look Mark this is you you've got another year bring these through, especially if we finish ninth or something, then it's a progression on last year. And then you give it right next year, the ninth, we definitely got to make playoffs. Or do they, have they lost faith in him and they don't think he's the man to take us up? So only the, the owners and the club can decide that. And, and with Les in there, it, I think it'll, it'll fall on Les's decision. Yeah. I mean, you're both, we're all of a similar vintage and we'll, we'll, we'll try and forget it, but that, that 1986 Milk Cup Final season, from my memory, there it was after that cup defeat. Never, never happened, in never <laughs> happened. But the, the season spiraled like it, it feels we won similar. the Anfield. We won the, uh, we won the <laughs> no, but the, from my memory, is the season yeah. kind of spiraled after that cup final. I think they let, lost seven at Sheffield Wednesday, got done four, five at home or Arsenal, and finished the season on a real, I think, it might be seven defeats in a row. But in the following season, there was no call for the manager to get sacked, and Jim Smith went out and sort of. You, you know, Bill, Simon Paul you Park you and, a few, job, and a few others. Yeah, yeah. but you five but, at the back, and then yeah, yeah. But, but, do, but do you know what I mean? It and it, he was allowed to go out and go right and prove on that. Do you think? Can you see something similar happening with Mike Warburton? But that, that was in a different day when there weren't hmm. social media and instant reaction. You remember us as fans? If we weren't happy, we were, we we either had to protest on the pitch or wait for like a, a Q&A once a year. Because by the time you're leaving the ground, you ate them all, they should all be sacked, it's rubbish. You, you Come Monday morning, you forget about it. Come Wednesday, you can't wait to go at the game. So you couldn't have that instant vent. Now, fans are venting and they're not even at the game. So yeah. it's, that, it's that instant gratification, as I said, that knee-jerk reaction. I think fans have a much bigger voice than they should. And like you look at the players, I know, so I know for a fact, like it really affected social media. It really affected Joe Lumley, Josh Gowen. That's when we weren't there, and I think that, they come off social media because it really, it really affected them. They, there's some players it don't bother, and some players it really affects them. But we're in an age where they want instant success. Back then, we're talking about if you, if you had a poor managerial reign, it was two seasons. Hmm. Back then, maybe three seasons if you had a poor reign. Now, when you take a job, you know if you're there. You've done well if you're there two years in a mm. job, and that's the way it is, and that's the way it's gone. But when you were there with Holloway, um, towards the end, you, your contracts weren't renewed, you, you left at the end of the season. Do you kind of know when you're going? Did you know sort of bef- way before you know you actually did leave that you are being eased out? Or I, I had a feeling. I had a feeling because I was close with Tony Fernandez and talking to him. Uh, Seeing Steve McLaren at the last 15, 16 games, and he would speak about Steve McLaren as well. I sort of lined Ollie up to say, look, I don't, I don't think we'll go get another year. Club was brilliant to me, they wanted me to stay, but I just didn't think it was right. Ollie brought me in. I'm, I think as an assistant manager, you got a you got to fall on the sword with the person that you go with. I've always done it, and that's the way I believe in it. I don't think you should stay on. But club were great with me. They they thanked us that we 
we hit all the marks that we had to when we come in. Our home form was one of the worst in the league. We got our home form one of the best. We got young players in the team. I think we got we cut 75% off the wage bill when we was there. So we I can look back and say, look, I was I was proud of what we done there. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Nice one. Right. We're away from home to save our lives, but our own record was different class. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one thing that has been under war, but in your waveform has been unbelievable, unprecedented in my lifetime. Yeah. In QPR, you know, sort of winning eight, nine games a season away from home. It's unheard of. I prefer of. to win at home, I've got to be honest. Yeah. All fans yeah. can see it then. Yeah. Of course. Right, gents. Um, so, uh, predictions for uh, Saturday's game at Preston. Um, it's not a Historically a happy hunting ground for Rangers, but they are unbeaten in their last two visits to Deepdale. So uh, I'll go to you first, Ben. What, what, what do you see happening on, on Saturday? Um, as you say, not, not a particularly happy hunting ground. I can remember going there quite a few times and uh, not enjoying the experience greatly. Um, I mean, Preston have sort of bobbed along a bit, haven't they? they they've had some poor runs, but then they, they just pull out a, a result that, you know, keep, keeps them back on track and they beat Blackpool, of course, uh, uh, the other day in, in, in Derby match. Um, they don't score a lot of goals. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, Rangers obviously have not uh, scored a lot of goals. So, so I think this has got to be a low scoring one, one all draw. Bert? I'm going one nil QPR, scrapping one nil away from home. Probably score last 10 minutes from a set piece. That's what I'm going for, one nil. Uh, yeah, I'm going to follow you in there. Just on the law of averages, they they they've got to win a game soon. Um, Preston have got nothing to play for really. Uh, Rangers are actually very good when they beat him in the, the game at Loftus Road early in the season. It was a three-two, really good game, soaking wet, and it's probably Lyndon Dykes' best best game in the QPR shirt. I think that day he was he was very very good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go two-one with uh, Lyndon Dykes to score the winner. Okay, gents, thanks for your time. Much appreciated. Pleasure. And um, enjoy your weekends. Fingers crossed. Cheers, lads. <laughs>